It's really humbling to speak after two stalwarts of neonatology. To be, to be sharing this session is indeed an honor to me. I'll be talking about the golden hour in neonatology. Quite a few different lectures have talked about it already. It was there in sepsis, it was there in ELPW2K. Bandari sir has talked about it. The golden hour concept was borrowed from trauma care where it was seen that replacement of the bleeding or the blood volume replacement, respiration, restoration and cardiac compression, the earlier it began, the better was the outcome and this was uh, taken from Dr. Cowley who is labelled as father of trauma, trauma, uh, trauma medicine. The first hour of life for a neonate represents a time period during which infant faces challenges that carry risk of short term and long term injury, lifelong development delay or even death. So this time has to be taken care of. It was a concept of the golden minute. Used in context of neutral resuscitation when needed to provide a maximum benefit to the first minute of the golden minute. So optimizing neonatal resuscitation was the golden minute and we are dealing with the golden hour. We will be discussing the resuscitation later. I will begin with, most often we have a baby who comes to us in an extramural NICU where unlike an intramural baby, we know all the history beforehand, before birth. In these extramural babies, we hardly know anything about it. So we should spend, or one of the team members should spend some time with the family to know the history. This allows to better serve the resuscitative needs of the neonate if you know whether there was uh, any fetal distress, oligohydramnios, absent and diastolic flow. We need to perform risk assessment by knowing the maternal and fetal risk factors. Review the maternal history of the mother like if she had diabetes mellitus in uh, pregnancy or PIH was there. And antenatal scans if this suggests Oligohydramnios or polyhydramnios should be known. If there is history of absent or reverse endoscopic flow, that helps in preparing for resuscitation. So the objective of further talks would be knowing the components, that is the team approach, how do we prevent hypothermia, how to provide effective but gentle resuscitation, delaying the clamping of cord, which is in vogue these days, appropriate transportation and stabilization in NICU, optimizing the respiratory support in first couple of hours and most importantly, especially in Indian context, preventing iatrogenesis, especially preventing sepsis. And with a lot of um, medical legal cases and cases of doctors getting beaten up, communication with the family is becoming more and more important. So, as a neonatologist, we need to work together in a team and we have to have effective communication with both obstetric team and the anesthetic team. We have to standardize the protocols, the checklists which are to be observed and skill development by simulation exercises done on routine basis. And we need to know how and why and what to do in this initial few minutes of resuscitation and subsequently in the golden hour in labor room and in NIC. Foremost is to prevent hypothermia. We need to keep the temperature of labor room or OT appropriate for 25 to 27. Radiant warmer should be switched on beforehand. Please don't save electricity there. Everything that comes in contact should be pre-warmed. So the linen should be pre-warmed. The temperature of the non-asphyxiated infant should be maintained between 36.5 to 37.2 degrees centigrade. But for infants who are less than 32 weeks, use radiant warmers and plastic wrap with a cap. The plastic wrap has been invoked a lot. We have to increase the room temperature to about 28 degrees AB. Using a thermal mattress prevents heat loss. And warmed humidified desalination gas are important as well. In resource limited setting, covering of newborn in clean food grade plastic bag up to the level of neck and swaddling them after drying is important. 
Providing them skin-to-skin -skin contact through kangaroo mother care goes a long way in preventing hypothermia and hypothermia-related morbidity. Therapeutic hypothermia is now being recommended even in resource limited setting. A new phase change material based device is available and there is evidence regarding its use and its efficacy in, even in Indian studies. The earlier it is begun, the better it is, so it can be utilized in the golden hour as well. Most important soon after birth is doing effective but gentle resuscitation. We know that a lot of volume going into the lungs or pressure going into the lung can cause of can cause a barotrauma, volume trauma, leading to pulmonary air leaks, even chronic lung disease. So we need to follow algorithm-based approach. We need to define roles and have effective communication. Effective ventilation is the key. One has to give appropriate rate of 40 to 60 per minute and appropriate volume. There are maximum chances of over distension is there during resuscitation when baby is not responding as well. We have to follow if the heart rate is increasing or not and we need to give a discernible rise in chest with our positive pressure breaths. Use of TPs in BMW babies gives a better control of time volume which is delivered to the baby. Many people will be using this TPs resuscitator now and this helps in controlling the PIP and helps in delivering feet as well during resuscitation. So this is important and one of the major changes which is seen in resuscitation these days. The other thing is targeted oxygen approach. Initially, when we learned pediatrics and resuscitation, we always began resuscitation with 100% oxygen. Then came room air resuscitation, pioneered by none other than one of our own, Professor Ramji. But now, it said that you have to follow this targeted SpO2, the pre rectal SpO2 uh, with the saturation monitor attached in the right upper limb. And you need to, you know, the normal saturation in 3 minutes is 70 to 75, and only by 5 minutes does it appear 85% when the baby will start appearing pink. Under 85, the baby appears to be cyanose. And so a blue baby doesn't trigger excessive oxygen to be provided because it can damage lung, it can damage eyes, it can damage brain. So all babies should be begin with room air resuscitation. All preterms should always begin with targeted oxygen approach. And first of all, we should always resuscitate with a blender and begin with FiO2 of 21 to 30 percent and gradually increase over next one to two minutes as per the saturations or as per the heart rate and response of the baby. The other thing to be noted in first minute itself is delayed cord clamping. American Academy of Pediatrics recommends it, European bodies they recommend it. It has been shown that delayed cord clamping leads to higher hemoglobin at 4 to 12 months of age. It improves serum ferritin during first year, improves total body iron stores. It is helpful both in term infants and in preterm infants. In preterm, it has been shown that Less blood transfusion is required during NICU stays and this delayed cord clamping is recommended for babies as freedom as 24, 25, 26 weeks now. No side effects like IVH or EBL have been noted, no uh, polycythemia has been noted, better control of blood pressure, better control of uh, ventilation is there if you practice delayed cord clamping. So delayed cord clamping is to be done on all babies except for babies who require resuscitation when uh, people think that baby should be handed over to pediatrician. Though some centers have started positive pressure ventilation even with delayed cord clamping, they say that they can give positive pressure ventilation or move back ventilation even while the baby is attached to the mother's placenta. So the standard guidelines are to delay cord clamping for more than 30 seconds. There is no upper limit. Some people say 30 seconds, more than 30 seconds, more than 60 seconds, up to 120 seconds or 180 seconds can also be practiced. No recommendation for infants who require resuscitation at birth. It can be used, but uh, it's not that it's a standard, it's not standard of care. Cord milking, that is, if we could not delay cord clamping, once the baby is in radiant coma, 
you leave an ample length of umbilical cord about 25 centimeters with the baby and gradually just strip the umbilical cord from the distal end to proximal end towards the baby three or four times and the blood which is laid in the umbilical cord uh, is stripped into the baby. This can be done after cutting the cord or it can be practiced even when before cutting the umbilical cord in which the cord is just milk. There are not many trials proving the efficacy of umbilical cord milking but yes some, especially from India, are coming over. One such trial which was published in Journal of Perinatology last year. In this, there were two groups of umbilical cord milking and delayed cord clamping. And the third one was both milking and um, delayed cl cord clamping was done with the primary outcome being hemoglobin and ferritin at six weeks. This was done on term babies. And the study showed that combining Milking with delayed cord clamping resulted in better iron stores at 6 weeks when compared to either interventions than alone. So there could be some benefit of combining the two interventions as well. But more studies showing long term outcome at 1 year, 2 years and 5 years need to be done as well. During the golden hour, transportation may be required to this baby and best principles of transportation should be followed. Stabilization in NICU should be done quickly. Keep the bed already ready. We need to inform that a baby is being brought over from labor room so that once the baby is in labor room, they are not searching for a bed. The vomit is already on. Every sterile precaution is already being taken. Optimize the respiratory support. Insert lines with asepsis. Provide source of energy, glucose, and uh, amino acid can be started right away. In optimizing respiratory support, early CPAP for preterm baby needs to be emphasized. Or as I would say, early NIPPV may be started to maintain the FRC of the baby and it helps to preserve the surfactant as well. Because secondary epilectasis leads to a lot of loss of surfactant. And so by giving early CPAP, we tend to preserve the surfactant which is already made antenatally. Selective Natural use of early surfactant followed by extubation and giving this baby CPAP is also a very good, almost established uh, uh, mechanism of giving respiratory support to the baby. So CPAP and surfactant should be used uh, quite readily for all ELBW babies in this golden hour. Now, optimal respiratory support to the preterm can be provided with a sustained inflation with the aim to give a long PI to the baby. However, a sustained inflation of more than a couple of seconds have been shown to have more complications and is not recommended. Early CPAP use is preferred than routine intubation. That is, early it was thought that, oh, it's a 800 gamma, will not make it, just intubate and give surfactant and put the baby on ventilator. Routine intubation is not preferred. Use PEEP all the time if we are ventilating because PEEP again optimizes your functional residual volume and helps preserve the um, surfactant. And ventilate at a rate of about 40 to 60 breaths per minute. CPAP should be started in delivery room itself if the baby has respiratory distress. These are the guidelines in the latest NRP guidelines as well which say that after resuscitation, if the baby is seen, look at the um, respiratory rate and attractions, if there is significant respiratory stress, begin CPAP in labor room itself. So CPAP should be started from birth in all babies at risk of RDS, such as those with less than 30 weeks gestation who do not need intubation for stabilization. CPAP with early rescue surfactant is what is the standard of care for babies with RDS now. Early surfactant administration is preferred and in those who require intubation for stabilization may be given surfactant in delivery room itself. Because earlier the surfactant is given, the better are the outcomes. Baby with RD should be given rescue surfactant early in course of disease. So sir, rescue surfactant therapy is giving surfactant to a baby with respiratory distress. And prophylactic surfactant therapy is giving surfactant to a baby before development of respiratory distress. So prophylactic surfactant therapy is now not recommended because as I showed that almost 30 to 40 percent babies may not actually require surfactant if you use early CPAP. So if the baby has distress, requires CPAP, requires some IFR to 
Then you give surfactant therapy following mm -hmm. ensure. Mm -hmm. WHO is coming. Now it is two minutes more. Okay, sir. In preterms who are intubated for RDS or HMD, administration of surfactant within first two hours of life compared to those who are given surfactant beyond two hours of life results in reduced pneumothorax by 30%, reduced PIE by 37%, decreased neonatal mortality by 13%, chronic lung disease by 30%. So, early surfactant therapy reduces um, many things. We have to prevent iatrogenesis during this golden hour. Transmission of infection should be prevented at all costs. Physical injury should be present, uh, prevented to the baby. Medication errors are quite common, especially in uh, hour of anxiety, especially if uh, asthma is there, then the concentration of adrenaline may vary. Acute lung injury caused by excessive use of tidal volumes during a distressed positive pressure ventilation to the baby who is not crying. IVH can occur, BPHN can occur if you do not use uh, volumes or uh, tidal volumes or drug volumes appropriately. We need to minimize brain injury, which can be done by gentle handling of the baby, avoiding head low position, avoiding high airway pressures for ventilation, adjusting proper ventilation that is not too much chest expansion and using pulse oximetry and blood gases. We need to see that CO2s don't get washed down below 40. Avoid rapid boluses of IV. Always even in newborns and asphyxia, we have to give boluses over 5 to 10 minutes at least. Preferably over 20, 15 to 30 minutes if uh, beyond the resuscitation we are giving. While giving chest compression during resuscitation, we need to give 100% oxygen. Last but not the least, communicate well with the family. Before birth, we need to communicate. As it was told that we need to tell them realistic chances of survival and what the baby may need in first hour. Allow the family to see the baby, the actual condition of the baby. Involve them in decision making. It's their baby. They need to know what the baby is suffering from and they are the ones who should decide what the baby needs. We are not the ones who, based on gestation, we can decide we will not resuscitate this baby. <coughs> to have a quality control, there are forms which are available and we need to have this delivery room golden hour form. They are readily available on the net. Then, during transportation, what we have used after admission to NICU, there are forms which can be filled in. So the take home message from talk is, we need to have strong communication. First with the obstetric team, then the parents, and amongst the neonatal team itself. We need to work as a team together. We need to follow best practical strategy, which is evidence-based. And above all, we should not suffer from hyposkinemia. We need to develop good clinical skills by appropriate trainings. So the promise of golden hour in neonatal care lies not only in evidence based treatment, but also in team structure, communication and proficiency. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. Very nice. And then, this one of the golden hour of neonatology. Question? Is there any question from the audience? I think it's the end of the day and everybody is very tired. Yeah, the last lecture. Uh, I think we'll leave the question so that uh, Unless somebody has a very pressing question to... Uh, you need to transport, the principles are the same, providing, um, preventing hypothermia, providing peak during transportation, through the principles preventing asepsis or hydrogenic uh, problems should be prevented. So it's, it's probably the same. If we can provide peak during transportation, babies with distress, that would be best. If we can prevent 100% oxygen being delivered during transportation, that would be best. So the principles of uh, optimal care would be same as in labor room and NIC. Thank you very much. Now it is the end of the...